All right, church, let's open our Bibles to Psalm 23. So we've been talking a lot about heavy, and today we're talking about purpose. Uh, I want you to remember from yesterday that God does not ask you to endure so you can prove yourself. God calls us to endure so he can prove himself to us. God doesn't say, if, if you really love me, I'm going to make you through, walk through the darkest valley. No, God says, I'm going to lead you through the darkest valleys of life so that you will know on the other side something beautiful, that I, I do love you, I do care for you. If we will pause and put ourselves in the position for God to lead us, even when he leads us, it's his presence that gives us strength. So today, we talk about purpose. We talk about the strength. How do I have a purpose when life will take me down a path I don't want to go, or sometimes life will take me down a beautiful, glorious path and lead me to green pastures, and other times it will take me into darkness and it will take me into storms, and we've been talking about some heavy things, and we could stop right there and be really, really good, but remember, God does not ask us to endure so that we prove ourselves. He asks us to endure so he can demonstrate himself to us, and in that is our purpose to experience more and more of God. As I've said before, I grew up in northern Indiana, and now I live in in Missouri. And in Missouri, we don't have blizzards, and we don't have a lot of snowfall. In fact, we have one plow, and we loaned it to Arkansas, so they don't even touch the roads when it does snow. We have tornadoes. Every area's got it suck, and in Missouri, it's tornadoes. But my father's from Missouri, and growing up in Indiana, every now and then, we'd have thunderstorms roll through northern Indiana, and I would watch my dad. My dad would stand in front of the window. I I thought it was kind of a big flex. I loved it. He'd get a cup of coffee and watch the storm blow in. And I would keep playing in the family room watching my dad. Because if my dad got nervous, I had a reason to be nervous. But my dad wasn't nervous. He would just sit there sipping his coffee, watching the storm come through. I remember one particular storm in April. I I was probably in junior high, and the storm was really blowing. It was dark, and it was windy, and my dad was standing in the window watching the storm, and he said to my mom, Marilyn, I think we should go to the basement, and I almost lost my ever-loving mind. Here's why. Because in the storm, my strength appeared scared. And then I remember him looking around at the three of us boys that were playing in the family room, and he said, I just think it's safer to go down in case the winds break the window. And my fear dissipated because my strength was being strong. Do you get what I'm saying? I was scared of every storm, but my dad was my strength. And when my dad stood there in that moment and he demonstrated wisdom and protection, my fear was gone. And I never saw a tornado, but I saw my dad. And it was beautiful. When my dad said, you'll be fine, I believed him. And I want you to know that the presence of God is being demonstrated not to get you through the hard times, not just to get you through the hard times. God is calling you to draw deeper into him because when you draw deeper into him, those experiences become beautiful and lush and gorgeous. Look at verse 5 with me. Psalm 23, verse 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Man, I could dance in this verse all morning long. Not exaggerating. We could have so much fun talking about it. But I want to introduce it to you and let you think about it. See, God's purpose for you is to love you. Wait, wait, what am I supposed to do? No, remember the 23rd Psalm is not what God wants from you. It's what he wants for you. God's purpose for your life is for you to be loved, to be valued, to be known. He does that for you. And there's a purpose that comes out of that. You see, I love what Dallas Willard writes when he says love. Love is to will the good of another person. You may not think your parents love you, but look back over your life and find the moments that your parents made choices that were for your good, and that's love. It's not love when it's selfish. They take something from you, parents, friends, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever the case is, coach, as the video just showed us. It's not when they draw something from you. Someone loves you when they're willing to will your good, which means sometimes God loves you enough to tell you no. 
And sometimes he loves you enough to say, knock it off. And other times he loves you enough to say, oh, keep going. Keep doing that. More. 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 You see, God's purpose is to love you because he knows that when you and I experience his love, we become lovers. Not in the creepy Hollywood way. We become lovers of all things, which means we start to will the good of creation. We start to will the good of our church. We start to will the good of our parents and our brothers and our sisters and our friends and our communities and those that are unlovely and unloving in return. We, because we've experienced the storm in God's presence, he calls us to experience his love, and by that we become lovers. It says in the verse, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Uh, Let me suggest to you that there's two possible understandings of what David means by table. It could be an actual table where a meal is served. Although in the time of David, that wasn't a common thing. You'll even see pictures of the Last Supper, the night Jesus was betrayed and murdered. You might notice that they'll show a table, but it's more of a table of our contemporary days rather than something that was probably 24 inches off the ground that they reclined around. You've seen pictures. That's possibly it, and and I'm comfortable if that's the imagery that David presents, but in some of my research and study, I, I found a perspective that seems to me to be as reasonable. I'm told that up in the mountains, they would call the grassy areas that grew a table. It would be up elevated. Now, for those of you who don't live in Michigan, if you have not taken your shoes off and walked barefoot through this grass, what are you waiting for? Uh, Having lived up here in the Midwest and moving to the central states, we don't have grass. We have green weeds. And you don't want to walk barefoot because they have these things down there called chiggers. I don't know what they are, but they're legitimately real. And I love coming back here. And people say, why is the grass so green? I'll tell you why. Because the hell they endure in the winters here. Snow brings nitrogen and elements, and the grass gets all happy because the snow leaves and the grass jumps in celebration, and it's glorious. Well, why am I telling you that? Because the tables in the mountains have been covered with snow, and it's the rich grass. It's not that weedy stuff. Remember, I told you on Tuesday, if you, if you remember, that a shepherd can't turn sheep into any field because if they eat noxious weeds, they might blow up. But a good shepherd knows that some of the best nutrients for their flocks are to take them up, elevated above the normal, and take them to special places. You see, when you get in the boat with Jesus, he's going to take you to another shore. And that shore is a better place for you to be, even though it cost you a storm to get there. Can I rephrase it? If David is referring to the grassy knolls in the mountains as a table... I want you to not miss the point. Nobody ends up on the top of a 10,000-foot mountain by accident. To get where God wants to take you, it's going to take purpose and effort. I, I, I have to believe with all my heart there'll be no lazy boy chairs in the new kingdom because we will not curse work. We will celebrate that we can contribute to the beautiful holy city where we're serving one another and loving one another, and it's a beautiful garden where God is growing amazing things for us to enjoy. I really love a God who feeds us a lot. And a good shepherd feeds his sheep. And he takes us up the mountain, which means we're going to have to exert some effort. You're you're not going to be able to float. The work we do for God won't feel like work, but it'll take effort. And he takes them to this top and he feeds them there and they get to see the beauty of his creation. And when they're full and content, he leads them back down into the valleys. Not always the valley of darkness, but you can't live your, mount, your life on the mountain. I know it's Thursday and I don't want to talk about it or think about it, but this week will end. And some of you are like, I don't want to go home. No, trust me. If God has brought you to the mountain this week and fed you on the rich 
blessings of this table that you're sitting at right now, that same God will go home with you. In fact, I promise you, he's already there. He is here with you and he's already there at home. He's preparing a table for you in the presence of your enemies. What is that all about? Well, listen, there will be people who will tell you, oh, stop it. You just got happy at camp. Or you're not really this person. Remember what we were doing the week before you went to move? And God says, no, no, I want you to remember this. Do you remember when I took you to the mountain and I fed you the richness? I can get you that here too. Every one of us is being led by something. We get to choose our shepherd. Jeff said brilliantly last night, everyone's going to get in a boat. Just get in the one Jesus is in, right? So you can go home. And I don't want you to fear going home because the same shepherd that will guide you in the tough will take you to the beauty and he will feed you with richness and provisions. And our purpose is to experience every day the love of God. That's why he created you. And if you do, don't be surprised when the richness of God's love because something, becomes something that you invite your friends and family to experience too. You become a lover. I want to show you Psalm 27 for just a moment here. It'll be on the screen. If you want to turn in your Bibles, that'd be cool. I think it's in there. Come on, people. That's the best I got today, right? Psalm 27, verse 5. For in the day of trouble... I'm hearing pages turn. I'll wait on you. That's the best sound a preacher ever hears, his Bible pages turning. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Notice that God likes to elevate us to get our attention. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent, I will sacrifice and make shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. I actually don't have time to treat this text well, but let me introduce it to you. What it's called a sacred tent is in the middle of a battle, the king would arrive to be with his troops, and they would erect a tent for the king, and the king would eat and sleep and worship God in the midst of the tent while the battle was going on around him. And I want to give you that picture. You may be going home to a battle, but you are invited to sit in the king's tent where he protects you, provides for you, and his armies fight for you. I hope that makes your tail wag. Because you will not leave here alone. You will go with the presence of God under the purposes of God. And God will elevate us above our enemies. It also says he will anoint our heads with oil. I'll be quick. I'm told that shepherds would carry anointing oil, and what they would do is they would take a wounded lamb and every cut and scrape, because remember, sheep are dumb, they run into things, they get flipped upside down and can't get themselves around, and so a shepherd has to take care of a lamb. So he would anoint their wounds and scratches and cuts. He would also anoint around their eyes, because if you've ever been on a farm, you realize that flies are gross and they love to get in the eyes of the horse and the cow and the sheep. And so they'd put the anointing oil around the face of the lamb, around its nostrils and around its eyes so that the bugs would not infiltrate their animal, their caring. So when we get injured and we get hurt following God and, and the world is taking shots at us and the battles that we enter in, they, they do hurt. It's not easy. It says that our shepherd is going to be anointing us, sometimes in advance, sometimes during the battle, and always afterwards. That our shepherd knows what we need. And for those broken hearts in this room today, call out to him. He wants you to give him access to your heart that he might heal it. And then it says, my cup overflows. And this is the part that I'm happiest to talk about today. I love the other pieces, but this one was for me. Sometimes when I study, God gives me a little happiness. And in the midst of it, I wake up excited to tell you about this today. And if you roll your eyes or you don't care, there's got to be somebody else in the room who needs to hear what I needed to hear. What does it mean, my cup overflows? For the longest time, I didn't understand that. First, we're talking about giving sheep a bath. And now we're talking about drinking from a cup. And then I did some research, and I found something that's amazing. Wine and oil, the imagery of the oil for healing and the wine of celebration. And there it is. What I was told in the, in the days of David, you would be invited into someone's home 
Hospitality was something God requires of all of us. Let's be there, not for the people who can reward us for it, but let's provide love and hospitality and generosity to those who have been broken or hurting, the single mom with three kids who never sleeps, never gets to eat what she wants, and never has time to even go shopping. How are we caring for her? But they said that when, when the king would practice hospitality, you would bring, he would bring you a cup and he would fill your cup with water or wine or whatever he was serving. And when the, the host of that party would see the cup become empty, the host would come and I guess the custom was if the host filled the cup full, he was inviting you to stay longer. If he filled the cup partially, he was telling you, uh, you'll be leaving, yes? It was a polite way of saying, the party's over, so here's a little, one more drink before you head home. But if he filled your cup, he was saying, no, no, don't, please don't leave. This, I want to be with you. Now, do you hear what David wrote? Our shepherd will never, ever let your cup get half empty. He is going to fill it and fill it and fill it, and David even uses the Hebrew word, it is going to pour over the sides and down your arm. It's like the anointing down the beard and onto the garment. What God is saying to us here, remember, he's not asking anything from you. He wants to give you this. He said, I am inviting you to stay in my presence and experience my love, and it will overflow, and you'll never need a thing. Church, do we have a good God or what? I'm going to get in trouble with some of you for this because you're instantly going to hate the genre of music I'm addressing. But there's a song by Luke Combs. It's called Take You With Me. It's about a dad who loved when his dad invited him to go with him. And now he's a father and his favorite thing is to say to his son, do you want to come with me? And his son wants nothing more than to be in the presence of the father. I hope today you can hear the sentiment of God. I'm going, to take, I'm going to be with you in the valleys and I'm going to take you to the mountain heights. I'm going to be with you every day. Your cup will be so full. God is saying, don't ever leave me. I want you with me. Are you at the table? Are you choosing to stay with him to whatever table he takes you to, to drink of the cup, to let his healing anoint you, to take you places you'll never get on your own. Some you'll like, some you won't, but all of them will demonstrate God's love. Please pray with me. Jesus, thank you for giving us your table. Thank you for offering us a love that we've never experienced. We've all been loved, but not like this. You love us in our unlovely. You love us in our worst. You love us when we're angry at you. You love us when we reject you and ignore you and act like you're not there, even though our souls are crying for more. And I thank you for loving us enough that while we were rejecting you and mocking you, stripping you, beating you, and punishing you for no reason, you said to your father, Father, forgive them. They don't understand. Now we do. Holy Spirit, thank you for teaching us. God, thank you for putting this all together. Thank you for being our good shepherd. We enter into your holy tent, safe from all the battles, loved for the rest of our lives. Father, may we love you it the same. I pray through the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.